Welcome to everyone here in the audience and, and the panelists. I certainly feel honored to be here. Um, you know, I, I think we have valuable resources here and I would echo uh, what uh, uh, the panelists have said. You know, it's a daunting task to think about disability. It's daunting to apply. And with my time today, I really just wanted to uh, sort of go through that. You know, it, it's social security certainly doesn't make it easy. A little bit about my background. I've been with Ketch's Law Group for about 11 years doing social security disability as well as workers comp. Um, but I've been doing social security for a total of 16 years. Uh, my first uh, law firm, I was traveling the country and I would do two to three hearings uh, in all different states. So I, it was a national sort of experience that I got. And I mentioned that because um, what's made me very passionate about this is really how uneven you will see different judges handle really every case. And I think that that's, that's what leads to a lot of frustration. There's, you know, judges are human beings. And when it comes to the final stage, which uh, uh, Ken was just talking about, the administrative hearing level, uh, it, it really can be based on what judge you end up with, which is entirely unfair. Uh, and there's ways to assist with that. So um, uh, that's really been my background. And, um, you know, uh, if we go to the first slide here, uh, when do you need a disability attorney? Well, as you've heard from Bob Robitaille, sometimes you don't need one and you can get on benefits uh, uh, through uh, your own diligence. Now, as Bob said towards the end, when, he, when his daughter was facing a hearing, it was absolutely necessary at that point. And I would really agree with that. Uh, you're dealing with, uh, at that third and final stage, you're dealing with judges and laws and rulings and highly technical things. A lawyer's job is to be persuasive, but do it in a fair way and convince a judge that this is a case I want to help out. And you know, there's a number of ways that us lawyers do that. Medical records, number one, uh, and, and as Ken and Bob were emphasizing, I, I support that fully. You know, a lot of times the judges I find are less concerned really with what conditions a person has, believe it or not, they're more concerned with what are their doctors saying? Do their doctors believe in them? Do their doctors give strong opinions? And you're gonna hear me use that word opinion a lot. Um, uh, medical source statements. These are statements from your doctors about what they think your capabilities are. That could be with ME, it could be CFS, it could be FM, it could be long COVID, it could be a number of chronic conditions. Uh, and I would, I would emphasize this too. Social security, they look at every case really as a kitchen sink approach. In other words, don't forget, if you have other conditions such as diabetes, low back uh, uh, difficulties, any kind of orthopedic issues that are overlaying MECFS, FM, chronic long COVID, use that to your advantage. Depression and anxiety is also something that can come uh, as an overlaid uh, 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 factor. So I would just always emphasize, keep that in mind that Social Security is going to be looking at all your conditions. So, you know, do you need a lawyer? Well, that's a case by case analysis. Keep in mind too, it is not a given that an attorney will take your case. So it all comes back to the same thing, whether you are trying to give the best uh, application to Social Security, keep in mind that if you're seeking a lawyer at the last stage, that attorney is going to be looking for the same quality because uh, since we work on contingent fee basis, contingent fee means we're only paid a legal fee if we win the case. And there's many uh, frustrating situations where we, we could spend years on a case and unfortunately come up empty handed. It's horrible for all involved first and foremost, the claimant applying for benefits, and then it trickles down to a lot of lost hours and hard work uh, on the practitioner's side. 
So that leads to uh, my section here on fees. The fees are contingent. That means the, they, they, we have to win the case and there has to be back payable benefits to an individual. Back pay means from the time you've applied to when the judge renders the decision or at the earlier stages when uh, if you're awarded benefits at the initial or reconsideration stage, that clock is running. Okay, and that clock is running for benefits on a monthly basis and uh, an attorney is paid 25% of the back pay with a ceiling, the legal fees can never exceed $6,000. So the maximum fee would be 6000. And that would require probably an individual taking as in as in uh, Bob's case as well with his daughter 18 months or around that time frame in order to accrue enough benefits that 25% of the back pay equaled 6,000. The average fee in all of my cases comes out to be about $3,200, $3,300. And that shows you that oftentimes there's not as much back pay involved. Uh, so the legal fee uh, could also be zero. Uh, if I help an individual and I do help at all stages of the process, if an individual applies and is awarded at the initial, that's the first phase, uh, oftentimes there is no back pay. Unfortunately, and there's laws on this too, Social Security excludes five months of a person's back pay, just completely evaporates. And that's just federal law. And so what happens is if you are awarded in the first stage of this, you're likely not to receive any back pay. And uh, that's something to keep in mind. So fees, it's, it's really just a piece of, of the pie if you are awarded. Uh, but again, my point is, just like you're trying to prove your case to Social Security, if you approach an attorney, the stronger case, which really comes down to medical records and opinions, that word again from your own doctors is going to be uh, critical to getting a lawyer on board who wants and, and can really take that case on. Um, what stage is a lawyer most useful? Really at the administrative hearing. And uh, one of the reasons for that is keep in mind, in Massachusetts, there's probably 12 or 13 judges total uh, between Boston and Lawrence and Worcester. And uh, they, they keep coming up over and, and, and over again. Uh, a good practitioner who's been doing this for a while will have seen and been in front of these judges hundreds of times and build up a rapport. Also, not only a rapport, but what is that judge looking for? What, what, what is that judge's preference on certain topics? And I think that, you know, what stage is a lawyer most useful? At the hearing level. That, that lawyer's job is to be persuasive and be the expert where a judge, a good judge will look to that lawyer and say, you know what, this individual knows this case inside and out, and I'm gonna trust uh, that I should award benefits. And that's really when um, on a close case, it can, uh, having, having an attorney can really take it. That all being said, a person could uh, go through the whole process without it, without having a lawyer. And, and uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what a hearing actually is. So currently, the hearings are all being conducted by telephone or video because of the COVID pandemic. And they've worked for the most part really well. I have not noticed any difference in the quality of what judges are asking or doing. There's been really no technical issues involved. And there's uh, rumors anyway that Social Security is going to keep this as a permanent fixture given that they've been able to speed up the time it takes to the hearing by probably two or three months. And uh, in Massachusetts, we've, we've gotten down on the backlog of uh, hearings that have been waiting uh, by, by, again, probably two or three months. So the new technology certainly has helped. What is a hearing? A hearing, it, it lasts about an hour, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and a judge will look to uh, the claimant, a claimant is a word for the person applying. The judge will look to that individual to add some life to this paper file that's filled with sometimes hundreds or thousands of pages of medical documents. And so the judge will also look towards the attorney for the legal arguments that 
should help prove this case. Uh, Ken Casanova talked about uh, a lot of these arguments, uh, rather a lot of these rules and laws that social security looks at. And there's not a ton, believe it or not, for uh, 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 MECFS and FM. Uh, but again, I would emphasize not, not, not the specific laws involved. I'd emphasize if a person can have their doctor really behind them. And I do uh, agree with Ken, you know, a, an MD or a DO, but here's something to keep in mind. Your, you could have great notes from a primary care doctor. It does not have to be a specialist. And again, as Ken mentioned, the, the longitudinal, that's a word for records over time. The longitudinal records can really support, if, if, if you have a primary who's seen you for 20 years, 15 years, this is a good person to ask uh, to complete certain forms. And uh, a lawyer can help give you forms that uh, social security doesn't really give you. These forms are customized to the laws, really the third bullet point I have on this slide, the laws or what we call grid rules or rulings. So what are these things? Uh, Social Security puts together different rules for essentially every possible uh, uh, disability, impairment, condition that exists. And uh, uh, there's, there's laws and rules really for everything. Um, I will mention this, and it's, a, it's something we haven't talked about on today's presentation. When a person is older, the closer they get to retirement age, the more likely you are to be awarded benefits. And the reason for that is just, it, it's sort of baked into uh, what, what I call these grid rules. Grids are automatic rules in certain situations where someone will be found disabled. And a bulk, as Ken mentioned, 80 or 90% of cases are awarded. I agree with that statistic. A bulk of that is when it overlays certain conditions with somebody getting to 50 years old getting to 55, getting to 60 plus. Each bracket has different rules. And they, as you can guess, it gets a little bit easier to get on disability as you approach those different uh, age brackets. And that's by design of social security. They feel that, well, we're gonna ease up the rules and laws as someone would be getting closer to retirement age anyway. And, and so keep that in mind. If, if you fall into the category of uh, 50 plus, if you have other conditions I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, those types of things can really help you. Uh, they can help you uh, tremendously. Uh, even, it, yes, each condition has to be severe, but uh, things that you might not be thinking, uh, uh, foot issues, for example, or anything that, that it, it makes it difficult to sit, uh, that can add, if you have MECFS, FM, uh, any type of chronic chronicity, something as simple as, as back pain or uh, uh, herniated discs, these types of things can really uh, move the needle as well. So we're using, as you can hear, I use all tools that, that are before me. Uh, uh, and you know that's something important to keep in mind. Um, I have on my second bullet point here, direct testimony and vocational expert. So the bulk of that hour long hearing is going to be spent um, with the judge asking the claimant, the person applying questions. We call that direct testimony. These are very formulaic. They're probably the same almost every case. And I, I, I call it the who, what, when, where, and why of disability. A judge wants to know who you are, uh, uh, why you're applying, what you've been through medically, what your background is in terms of jobs and work, and what your activities right now really are. We call those activities of daily living. And a judge sort of sizes up each case by listening to what these answers are. If you have a lawyer or, or if you're doing the process on your own, make sure that you're prepared for these questions. You can search them online and you'll get a pretty pretty good accurate uh, list of what is probably asked. But again, it's gonna fall into background, you know, high school, education, marital status. It's gonna go into medicals, the bulk of it. You know, what is going on with, 
with your conditions, treatment, frequency. And then finally, it's gonna go into the third area, which is just day-to-day -day questions. Can you sit? Can you walk? Can you go grocery shopping? Can you drive a car? These are the common things that will come up with your direct testimony. When a lawyer is with you at hearing, we're allowed to ask uh, questions after the judge asks. And what will happen is um, I will often keep a running list of what important questions have not come up. A judge does not like when I re-ask the same question. They're, they're very tight on time as we can imagine. So I will only ask questions that are important and help move the needle in the direction of winning. Um, uh, uh, vocational experts, what is that? During each hearing, and, and they do this on every case, there is someone uh, by telephone who's called a vocational expert. That's a fancy word for a job expert. This person will classify your past work. Aside from a person's conditions, their age, I would have to say the most important variable that I see is what their past work is. Uh, the more labor intensive your past work is, the more likely you are to win your case. And in other words, if I have someone over 50 with certain conditions and their past work was, let's say, carpenter, for example, that is a high likelihood that individual will win under the different rules, those grid rules that we had mentioned. So you can imagine the inverse of this. Somebody has a job that is, say, administrative in nature or uh, requires high level of education, such as a teacher or, uh, or, or somebody in a professional setting like an accountant. This is going to be a challenging set of, of, of rules to get around. Why? Well, Social Security is always trying to use that vocational expert, the job expert, to see if someone has what we call transferable skills. What that means is if you have a, a good education and skills at a desk, the likelihood that you, you have skills for, say, telephone work or skills that are a little bit easier, but still light in nature are, are there. And that can create uh, challenges that us lawyers have to figure out ways to overcome during a hearing. So uh, um, definitely those are factors. The job expert never asks you questions. And when I say you, I mean the, the person applying for benefits. It, it's something that the judge and the lawyer will go back and forth. And I'm allowed to ask the expert questions. And oftentimes I will get them to change their opinions. And, and what are their opinions? Well, during a hearing, a judge will ask things like, uh, well, Mr. or Mrs. Expert, do you think there's transferable skills uh, that John Smith has for other desk work, sedentary work? And uh, I can ask uh, cross-examination that can, and, I've, and, and we've had a lot of good luck with uh, showing that that expert is going a little too far. That's another reason that an attorney is, I would say, a very good idea during one of these hearings. These, the, the experts need to be challenged. And oftentimes they'll say things that are inaccurate. Uh, time frame for a decision. Once your hearing is done in front of the judge, uh, I would say with, with fairly good accuracy, 30 to 90 days, most administrative law judges will get a decision out to people. And that decision is in writing. It's very lengthy. It's filled with all kinds of legalese. You know, um, uh, it's not meant to read very easily. It has a lot of laws in it, and it's it's uh, confusing. Uh, if it says fully favorable on it, that means you've won. And if it says unfavorable on the notice, uh, it means that we have to do some more work. And that leads me to post decision appeals. The last bullet point here. Yes, uh, one of the most common questions I get as an attorney is what happens if we lose that hearing? Are there other roads? And I always tell a person, yes. I say, we'll talk about that after the hearing because uh, let's stay positive. But just so everybody in the audience knows, yes, uh, this could be appealed to what we call appeals council. That's a group of judges in, in Falls Church, Virginia, who look to see if 
the uh, the uh, judge has made any errors of law. Uh, if that uh, uh, doesn't uh, change the outcome, if we can't find any errors of law, uh, sometimes that unfavorable decision will be affirmed. We could then appeal it to federal district court, which at that point, the likelihood of changing the outcome is not great. And I think the, the likelihood of finding a lawyer to do that, unless it's a really egregious case, is very, very low. Um, and so, you know, those are just some of the things that uh, pop up. If, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, just kind of summarizing this, increasing the odds of winning uh, and, and prevailing here. So medicals, medicals, medicals. It really all comes down to uh, uh, what your doctors are saying. I find, again, doctors are, I'm, uh, judges are less concerned, as, as crazy as it sounds, with the exact diagnosis that you have. They're more concerned with whether your own doctors are behind you. And that has made the difference in so many cases that I've had. Supportive statements from physicians. And these can, be, these can be paragraphs, these can be forms that are filled out that answer the critical questions. Could this person sit for 30 minutes? Are they going to be off task? If so, what percentage of a day, of a work day, would someone be unable to focus? Focus and concentration, remember, are huge. Uh, you know, uh, can somebody lift? Uh, Social Security and really that, that job expert, there's a million and one jobs out there. And some of them are extremely uh, sedentary, which means sit down and very non-physical. Um, uh, so getting supportive statements from a doctor that say, you know, a person could not focus, a person will miss three, four days per month. Uh, did you know that if a person... If your doctor supports that you would miss more than really two days of work per month, two days per month, that under the law is enough to be found disabled if, and here's the big if, if it's well supported by the treating physician, as Ken said, an MD or a DO. And that is fact. That's the law. And we utilize that factor in almost every case that I have. Um, consistency of treatment, again, uh, with MECFS and FM, uh, 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 our organization does have resources. Uh, if, if, if you're new to this diagnosis, if you're learning about it, uh, that talks about what type of medical specialty uh, could really help. And this could range uh, uh, from neuro to uh, uh, orthopedic to rheumatologist. Uh, to your primary care, to numerous other uh, specialists. So if you have specialists involved, I think that that's a great thing. Consistency of treatment. I haven't met a judge that, that, that the, the biggest pet peeve a judge will have as well. Counselor, they'll say, I don't see any records for the past three months, two months even, they'll, they'll complain about. So, you know, consistency of treatment is very big when you're applying for benefits uh, like this, and it can completely increase the odds uh, of, of winning. Um, next slide, please. One of the most common questions I get every week is, if I'm on benefits, can I then work? And going back to Ken's point from the very beginning, I agree with him. If you're applying for benefits, I would not suggest doing a part-time job at the same time. Again, Social Security, that's sort of a big no-no for them. It's an easy way for them to deny the case. Um, you know, so I would say uh, stopping work, uh, if you can and, and should, then you should. It will increase your, your conditions. So uh, once you're on disability though, what can you do? And this is important. I've had so many clients say to me, is that it? Uh, can I go back to work? A am, I, am I written off? Do I, you know, so I always say, Social Security would love nothing more than you to be off the benefit and back to work. So they've created a couple good programs, and I think that they're great. One of them is um, the work incentives program. 
Social Security allows a person to collect the monthly benefit check at the full level and try and dip their toes into working again. And this is called the Work Incentives Program. Every three-year period, a person can work and make any amount of money. There's no limit on it for nine months during that three-year window that Social Security looks at. So this can get uh, confusing and it can cause problems as well. So really, if you're on benefits, keep track of the months that you are working. They're not consecutive. I've had numerous people call me just this past month that they were you know, taken off benefits because they just went uh, they went um, beyond the nine months. It's not consecutive. They look at three years of that. The other really good tool you have, though, as Kent had mentioned in, in his introductory slide about substantial gainful activity, that's a fancy word for what does Social Security actually even consider work? And this is not based on hours. I've had so many clients ask that. It's based on the good old-fashioned dollar. And Social Security looks at 1350 currently is the amount. If you are making less than that amount, and it has to be less, and we're talking gross numbers here. If you're making less than that, it does not, it's not considered work because the amount is not substantial enough for Social Security. So if you do get on benefits, and I, I tell clients as a rule of thumb, remember certain months have five weeks in it. So be careful. $250 gross a week is a safe zone, I call it. Um, you know, that would add up to about $1,000 a month. And certain months that have five weeks, you're right at $1,250. So $250, maybe $300. You could work that amount and make that amount indefinitely uh, while, your case, uh, while you're on benefits going forward into the future. So uh, I know I could talk all day about this. I could probably talk for 24 hours straight about Social Security. So um, I, I wanted to sort of wrap this up and just give a, 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 a quick uh, overview. But uh, thank you, everybody. And, you know, more questions will come up. And uh, I'm here. I'm, on, I'm a board member as well for Mass MECFS FM. So I'm not going anywhere. And uh, I'm happy to help in any way, shape or form that I can, but thank you very much.